It is raining on Guam today, and so I thought Typhoon Karen might be a nice song to start. That is Typhoon Karen from the Tap First Brothers. Um, Half a day to us, Hamzu, in honor of Michael Luhan Bavako Gwawi, host Mizu Tatlu, for the Estina episode Fenatsu. Oh, I am very excited um, for today's episode of Fenatsu. It is a mess. Chamorro episode of Fenatsu, right? And during mess, Chamorro, you know, on Fenatsu, we always focus on Chamorro things. But in during mess, Chamorro, we try to really sort of get into into particular issues, uh, particular experiences, especially around bringing back the language, bringing back the culture, finding ways to tell our stories. And so, um, as many of you know, uh, I have, since the start of the pandemic, hosted Zoom Chamorro classes every Saturday. And so, what I've done for the past few years is invite some of the students in my classes to come and share some of their experiences and their relationship to the Chamorro language, um, why they're learning it, um, sort of what was their experience as a Chamorro, whether in the Marianas, whether in the diaspora. And so I've got four people in the Zoom room with me right now. Half a day, song and half a day, song and half a day. <laughs> and so before we get started and before we hear from them, we've got Janae Limchiako, we've got uh, Davina. Armstrong Cruz, and we have Tristan Quintanids, and we have Jesse Neal. We may have another uh, who will join us in a second, but I wanted to share a little bit about why I've gathered them here and then why I have a regular episode of Fanatsu that focuses on Chamorro language learners. And so the, um, the majority of the Chamorro people do not live in the Marianas Islands, and the majority of the Chamorro people do not speak their native language. And that is, those are two simple, sobering facts. And so far more Chamorros live outside of the Marianas today, and the majority of Chamorros, more than 80%, cannot speak their native language. And so it becomes one of those things where we can kind of uh, lament, simply lament things, say, oh, things have changed, or malingui kustumbri, malingu esti, right? Or we can kind of look at what has changed and think about, even if people are away from the islands, what networks can we form to connect people to their islands? What can we do to make Chamorros, regardless of wherever they are, still have the possibility to learn more about where, they, where their heritage and where their roots are, even if people don't have Chamorro speakers in their families anymore? What can be done to connect them to others who do have the Chamorro language, who are willing to share it, and to others who want to learn as well. So this is why for me, um, especially as somebody who grew up not speaking Chamorro and was teased because I could not speak Chamorro, it's important that we get rid of the stigma of sort of being in the diaspora and disconnected from your islands, get rid of the stigma of not being able to speak Chamorro, right? Get rid of that stigma and instead just normalize the idea of everybody always learning. No matter that, no matter whether you are the only Chamorro that lives in Maine, actually there's probably a few Chamorros in Maine. Uh, I know there's a few Chamorros in Wyoming. You know, there's there's quite a few Chamorros in Florida. There's, there's, there's a heck of a lot in, in Las Vegas. I mean, um, not to say anything about Chamorros loving to gamble, not at all, 
You know, they ban cockfighting on Guam, so all the Chamorros move out to Vegas. Not saying anything about that, but what's it called? Let's get rid of the sort of the older ways because in for as some of those who are present in the Zoom room today may may express, you know, the 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 ways that kind of we've thought about culture and language and identity, it's done a lot to make people feel alienated, stuck, disconnected. How can we rethink those things so that we can be empowered to grow, to learn, to share? Right. And so that's the goal for this, normalizing the learning of the Chamorro language. And so, okay, I know that none of I know that no one is watching to listening to listen to me because I'm always talking. And so let's pass it off to uh Janae Putfabot. So I want you to go around to each of you. And when it's your turn, just start us off by giving us a sense of your your background, if you know your family clan, right? And then uh what was what was your connection to Chamorro heritage and language? So, Janae put for what? Hafede i na'anhu si Janae, and that's about as much Chamorro as I really know. Um, <laughs> I uh, very good at memorizing phrases, not so much the grammar, which is also true for English. Um, I grew up with my grandparents who were uh, moved directly from the States into the military life. Um, we're from Santa Rita. My mom still lives there. I was also lucky enough to live there during high school. Go Dolphins. Um, I mainly grew up stateside and I learned Chamorro from the Nevenas and bits and pieces from uh, just being around my grandparents and, you know, things like Toka and Benetsu and all, all the words that your parents would say at you. Um, yeah, I uh, I I am enjoying learning it in a way that's um, without pressure or without any kind of stigma to it. Because moving from stateside to uh, Santa Rita in high school, even though I was Chamorro um, or half Chamorro, um, it definitely was very different. Um, going from one place to the other. And now as an adult, it's really nice to uh, reconnect and reclaim the inheritance um, that is mine. So, yeah. Um, uh, Davina, put for book. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Half a day. Um, my name is Davina. Um, I, my, I, I grew up in the States. Um, I have actually have never been to Guam. Uh, it was actually supposed to be kind of in my family. It was this rite of passage to go with our grandma, uh, or with my grandma, <laughs> um, to Guam. Um, and I was her, I was the, the youngest child's only child. Uh, so I was a few generations, um, uh, pretty, pretty young. Um, when she unfortunately passed away and I could never go to Guam and, um, and, and you know, see what was happening and meet my family over in Guam. Uh, so, and, and after that, it became kind of one of those things where since I was also the only, um, at the time, I was the only half white and half Chamorro, the only mixed at the time, the only mixed person in my family, um, I kind of became the you know, uh, you, you know, the joking around like, well, you know, I'm I'm half anyways. So, you know, why, you know, ki that kind of stigma. And I, I became very um, ki kind of very uncomfortable in my own skin to even say I was tomorrow. So most of the time I would say I'm just I'm just mixed um, to a lot of people I met. Um, because if I ever ran into someone here in the States, um, they would also say that um if i said yeah i'm actually half tomorrow they would say no you're not um because i had never been i don't even you know i don't speak the language uh the one thing i have though is i have our family's red rice recipe <laughs> so my my grandma only taught me that so because i was the youngest of the youngest <laughs> so 
<laughs> that's my my yeah. yeah my one my one brag <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for, this is just awesome. thank you so much uh for sharing that and and as a fellow chamauli as uh as we used to i people used to say back in the day for half white half chamau chamauli um yes i I can sympathize with some of that. I mean, people, even when I could speak Chamorro, people would always tell me, you, how did you learn Chamorro? And I'd be like, uh, well, and people tell me, that, but you speak it so well, even though you're only half. And I'd be like, hmm, I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters your percentage <laughs> in terms of that. So thank you for sharing uh, those experiences, though. And so uh, Tristan, put for book. Pogo, Pogo. Hey, everyone. My name is Tristan Quintanita. I'm 24 years old. I live on Guam. I'm from the village of Agates. Um, I am half Filipino and half Chamorro. And uh, growing up, I've always been kind of like sad, like going to my Filipino side of the family and everyone can speak Tagalog. And then going to the Chamorro side of my family, noticing they only really speak uh, English. Um, my grandfather's generation, I would say, was the last generation where they were naturally taught to speak Chamorro. And I think it was during my dad's generation where the whole uh, don't speak Chamorro, speak English thing sort of started. And you know, very effective by my generation. None of my cousins and I are very uh, fluent in the language. Um, I got really into the culture around like my senior year of high school. Um, at the time, I wanted to really like learn a language so I could maybe like talk to my grandparents in Chamorro. Um, also, too, around the same time was my first fest pack, and it was the fest pack 2016. So that was uh, Guam hosting. So that was a very like uh, impactful part of my cultural um, identity. Um, I think it really ignited a passion for me to like learn more about my history, learn more about my culture. Um, so after that, I enrolled in UOG and. I knew like I wanted to major in Chamorro studies from the get-go. In fact, uh, Dr. Bavakwa was one of my first Chamorro teachers, one of, um, not Chamorro teacher, but like Chamorro uh, program professors. I actually really wanted to have you for Chamorro class, but I think the schedules never really lined up. But I did have you for Chamorro culture. That was a very fulfilling class, I gotta say. Um, in my time, I just graduated too. So I got my Chamorro studies degree, got a degree in political science. Um, I took six years of six classes in Chamorro at the University of Guam, plus two, uh, all of my Guam public school Chamorro classes. And even after all of that, I would say I'm above a beginner level, but I'm only really entering the intermediate level. I'm not even at the point where I could hold a conversation in Chamorro. I think I've gotten a really good understanding of the grammar, but I have not memorized a lot of words. So every time I'm talking to someone, I can hear them say like, hey, and did you know the, and also because, and that's why, and this is why, and, and my name is, so it's a lot of, I feel like I have a Mad Libs understanding of Chamorro whenever I'm hearing it. And it's up to me to kind of fill in the blanks and use context clues to understand because I don't have a lot of vocabulary. It's very funny when I put it that way, but I, it is a real struggle to kind of understand. And even though I've had all these classes, I bought all these books, I think, uh, practice has been the thing. I've got family members who speak Chamorro still alive. Um, unfortunately, my grandparents passed away. So that initial goal that kind of started me on this path kind of like can't be uh, achieved anymore, but I try not to let that get me down. I don't have a very strong like language practice network. And so I think that's the kind of like um, hole I'm trying to fill right now. And I think that's kind of what drove me to join this uh Chamorro class to begin with which was I know I should be practicing but it feels weird to open up a book and read drills to myself and like I don't really feel stimulated by that kind of practice it doesn't really feel like it's helping Hungen mm. uh Tristan for for sharing Hungen and how I remember you from uh from UOG of course but and I'm glad that you did become a Chamorro studies major. And, I, and I'm glad that you're continuing your learning of Chamorro. And so, Jesse put for both Hogu Pogu. 
Um, I currently reside on the lands of Nipmuc and Massachusetts people in Massachusetts. I'm finishing up my master's degree in women, gender, and sexuality studies, where I am writing my Nana story, um, Teresita Ignacio Santos Curry. Um, I am currently applying to, well, I got into PhD programs, um, and I am hoping to make that a book um and write about her experiences with like the Japanese occupation and American education and also just living as a Chamorro woman in the U.S. and kind of the legacy of all of that it feels kind of weird for me to be doing that because I didn't grow up with like a really strong connection to Chamorro culture at all um my Nana never really talked about it because she distanced herself more um but I'm excited to be doing this now um and move into this so yeah Oh no, Sidus Masi, and thank you for yeah, that's right. I, I remember now sort of your your project involving your non. Oh my goodness, thank you for reminding me about that. And so thank you again to all of you, Sidus Masi, Purifanatun Mizu Guini Palku. Thank you all for joining here today. You know, and for and because I know that you know some of these issues can be uh, you know a little bit difficult to talk about because um for many Chamorros, uh it is something which is both very visible and very empty at the same time. Because you can have, for example, a family which 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 gathers and parties, and you feel like there's this this, you know, there's there's definitely this exuberant quality to being tomorrow, but then a hollowness at the same time. Right. So for example, I, I like sometimes I think of it as sort of the the family which um has like Guam flag stickers everywhere and Guam flags in the house, but then uh, does not tell any stories or legends or sort of has no real connection except for sort of that pride, right? And so so I know that this can be sort of a tricky thing to talk about because uh, for a lot of Chamorros, nahungi uh, nenkanu, the food is enough, right? Just sort of that we have our food, that's that's good enough, right? Because uh, but for more and more people, I find that they want to go deeper. They'd like to know more than that, um, that the food is wonderful. And I hope, Davina, that one day I do get to, to try the red rice that you have learned the recipe of. You know, I, I hope you've, uh, you've, you've put it out there. I feel like Nicolas Cage and National Treasure, except this is going to be Chamorro Treasure. I feel like we're going to, we're going to, me and my party, Jess, we're going to break into your house and steal your recipe or something like that. And just kidding. And oh, I imagine the military too. The military wants to steal the recipe. And we just say we want to steal it to keep the military from getting it. And I hope, I hope there's a tomorrow who works at Netflix and I hope they're watching and I hope they just heard that pitch because uh, we can build it out from there. <laughs> but so let's, uh, okay, let's move to another. Now, the conversation, as I said, it's very organic. So feel free to kind of take uh, my questions in any direction that you'd like. But so um, what would you feel was Chamorro that you got from your elders or your family? So we've heard a little bit. We've heard, for example, uh, uh, recipes that were shared, but we've also heard that stories weren't passed on. Some stories were passed on. And so... Um, and so, uh, Janae, we can start with you, so. Uh, I would say for my grandparents, um, they were very, very devout Catholics. And I realized that for them, uh, faith was very much as much about culture as it was about the faith in the church, because all, all of our experiences were wrapped up in the community that they helped build and support down in Southern California. Um, they would go around with um, the Fatsma, which I learned when I moved back to Guam is you know still done back home. But uh, they'd go around Southern California, eventually Vegas, um, and then to even their like sibling states like Tennessee and whatnot. Um, and at those parties, you know, it was the rosary first in English, but it was that role of the uh, tessa, you know, the rosary leader. Um, <laughs> and 
they passed my grandmother's anniversary was a few days ago. So a little emotional, but, um, and in that we learned, you know, the chinchuli, the reciprocity, the, you know, being a leader within your community, making sure everyone's taken care of, um, and just community really. It wasn't just the food, it wasn't just the faith, it was that Chamorro sense of community, which if you guys ever do get to go back um, home for those that haven't been there, um, the community is very similar back there, even in Vegas, um, Western Washington. Um, and those are the things besides the pride of being Chamorro and like the, the more structural aspects of the culture, those are what they passed on to me and my family. Um, and yeah. Just <laughs> my sense. Uh, Divina, Divina put for what? Yeah, uh, I am. My, my grandma um, mainly um, told me stories about um, her time in, in Guam. Um, she, she actually, um, when she was, when she was young, um, cause I, I guess I was, uh, one of the, the few cousins, uh, that would just bug her until she would just tell me, uh, stories in Guam, uh, about Guam, uh, because she was very much did not want us to speak the language and stuff like that. Um, at the time, you know, she's, she was much older. Um, in that generation, and I would, was like, what was life on, like, what was life like on the island, just tell me, and she um, always told me the stories about uh, the chickens um, and roosters, <laughs> and um, how they were, uh, they're better than dogs, because <laughs> uh, they're the, they're a great alarm clock, um, and they let you know when uh, someone's coming up to uh, the house, uh, and then that she would, uh, they had, I guess, like chickens um, kind of lining their property and, well, you know, tied to a string and had like the circle. And she would make, we would know if we liked the person because then the chickens would behave. And then if they, if we didn't like the persons, the chickens would, uh, would get them. And I was like, what? <laughs> Grandma? <laughs> Because I think I was five at the time. And I was like, what do you mean chickens just attack you? <laughs> just like attack intruders. Okay. That, all right. Um, so she always just had the funniest, uh, you know, from growing up in the States to me. I was like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And I was like, no wonder oh you goodness. like the States. That's so weird. <laughs> like, that is. That is that is such a cool story though, because yes, there are chickens everywhere, and it's um, it's like a. Some people think that the national bird of Guam must be a chicken, because there are so many chickens everywhere, and uh, <laughs> that it's true. Uh, I remember uh, once uh, a documentary film crew came to Guam, and then uh, the director was very keen on very clean audio, and so they were interviewing war survivors in their backyards and there was chickens everywhere. And then, so she was like, wait, you know, she was gonna say roll, but then she was like, wait, 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 I hear a chicken. Can we get rid of that chicken? And I'd be like, I don't know if we can get rid of that chicken. She's like, there's a, I think there's a dog next door. There's a dog. And I'd be like, uh, boony dogs and chickens. That's kind of the, the sound. It's like, it's like the sound of the ocean on Guam. There's the sound of the ocean and then there's the sound of the boonie dogs and the chickens. But thank you for sharing that experience. So I've never heard that though about uh, the chickens actually giving you an alarm on people who you like and you don't like. That's pretty cool. Sidzus <laughs> Masi. And so uh, Tristan, for you. Before I start, I'll say like, I have I, always, I have definitely encountered that where I feel like the chicken's giving me a vibe check. Like this guy, the chicken just went crazy. What's up with this guy? <laughs> no, nah, but uh, wait, what was the question again? Sorry, I'm still cracking up over that. Oh no! So just uh, because I think for you know one of the things that we face is in the past, you know, Chamorro culture identity language, it just always got passed on. Right, because 
everyone spoke Chamorro. And so if you could learn another language, but you still spoke Chamorro to your kids, right? And so the sense of identity was just always passed on. What we've seen in the 20th century, though, is that it not everything gets passed on, right? So that some people will. Um, and in the diaspora, it changes even more because sometimes it comes with memories that people, negative memories from the war, from other things, and they don't want to talk about their connection to the past. And then it results then in generations which, like, you know, they may see, you know, they they may see that the family keeps a Guam flag in the house, but they don't really know what it means. And so, um, so Tristan, for out of the three, uh, out of the four of you, sort of, you're the one that's currently living on Guam. And so, but I do want to stress though, because people people tell me, oh, you know, the Chamorros in the diaspora, they don't know anything about the culture, language, they don't know who they are. To be very clear, I find there's lots of Chamorros on Guam and in the Marianas who aren't sure about who they are or may not feel strongly connected to culture and language. And so it's not a divide, it's a spectrum. It's not a divide, it's kind of like a spectrum. And so, so Tristan, but your, your experiences and your thoughts. Okay, okay, thank you for uh, wrapping it up for me. Um, I would say it's a very interesting experience I've had. Um, I have been taught like cultural values, like Tensuli, uh, but I don't think we ever gave it a name. It was just a thing that we did. You know, you show up to a fiesta early, you help them set up, put up the canopy, put away the food, um, help the nana. Um, and then after the party is over, you stay back a couple hours until everyone leaves and then help the crew put away, um, things like that. But we never really gave it a name. So I didn't know it had a name until I learned about it in class. And I was like, oh, OK, this sounds a lot like what we did. Um, wasn't taught tomorrow. Um, I have never really been told a lot of stories growing up about family members. Um, I think in my generation, also to the sort of like um, the lineage, the emphasis on knowing who you're related to, knowing how far back you go. I don't think that really um, was emphasized. Like my when my dad talks to his cousins, I, he can go back like generations. Oh, who's his auntie? And then blah, blah, blah. and I'm thinking to myself like I've never heard this person's name before. <laughs> uh, we don't bring it up, but there, there's not not like a effort to like teach like kind of like a you should know but i won't teach you but you should know and if you don't know um that's on you kind of like uh boy just listen <laughs> isn't like, that oh. isn't that funny isn't that funny govda nancy how you're I can so see in your wonderful. eyes i can see in your yeah, eyes you felt that too right Hungen, Hungen, and oh, we've got some people responding on with emojis to the live stream because they feel it too. Because it's one of those things. It's kind of like a. It's like a. I remember. A, I remember. You know, when I used to teach at UOG, sometimes I would have students who really wanted to learn to speak tomorrow, and I would encourage them. You know, the time you spend with me is just four hours a week in class your family, talk to your family and stuff. And if their family wasn't supportive, sometimes I would end up going and meeting with the, the, student, the student's family and talking to them. And then I remember once uh, one student had a grandfather who could speak great Chamorro. He spoke Chamorro to me. I spoke Chamorro back to him. And then when his grandson was like, I want to see, see Pops, how come you don't talk to me in Chamorro like that? His grandfather was like, you should already know tomorrow. And it was like, and I was like, Senor, how would this child know to speak tomorrow if you didn't teach him? How that reminds you... me of this like uh, short story. My dad would tell me a lot about his experience growing up, which was um, some uncle will come up to him. Boy, where's the rake? I don't know. Boy, where's the broom? I don't know. Boy, where's the knife? I don't know. Nana boy, what do you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow. I guess that was the environment he grew up in. I guess uh, he helped me by toning that down a little bit when he raised me. Mm. Oh. No, well, 
Sidus Masi Tristan for sharing that though, because I think many people can uh, can definitely relate to how in the past, like uh, like my grandparents, for example, genealogy and family connections, it was like it was like your nana was could beat the best AI chess player. <laughs> like your nana could like she was like a supercomputer, right? Like she could remember everything and everybody and all of these details. And then we think nowadays, and I I forget what night The Last of Us shows on TV, even though I'm trying to watch it. I, I forget a, I forget what streaming service Ted Lasso is on sometimes, even though I'm trying to watch it. Like I can't even remember like basic stuff. And then to think to our grandparents who could like trace, you know, like your your seventh cousins. <laughs> and stuff like that. And so Sidus Masi Tristan for bringing that up. Jesse, I wanted to, to hear from you, especially because uh, sort of you're, you're using your academic work to reconnect across generations. And so put for both. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like we've done a lot of the like naming of things that are tomorrow that we've never seen as tomorrow or labeled as tomorrow um, and like kind of reclaiming culture that way. Um, Definitely. I'm also the cousin who will bug my Nana um, and ask her a bunch of questions. Um, and I've always been that way. Um, and I think it's led to more of my cousins being interested in tomorrow culture and feeling like they can ask more questions and get interested and not have to be perfect about it and not have to know everything, but just knowing something is better um, than nothing. I think that we have like a really interconnected family um, and like all of my cousins are are really close. Um, and that's been awesome, but also just like the family knowledge. And even if it's not like a complete story, or if it's not all of the details that I might want, just knowing some of the things that our family has been through and like has experienced and, and their connection to like their elders. Um, like my Nana talks about her, her mom and dad, and I love hearing those stories. Uh, but yeah, I think that being able to do it in sort of an academic way is nice because I have access to like institutional like funding so that hopefully I can go to Guam because I've never been. Um, but it's also kind of weird because I feel like I'm kind of an outsider like studying, but also because like I have this story in this this family. Um, it's like a little bit of both and it's been it's been nice. No, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think, yeah, I would encourage more and more Chamorros who are pursuing higher education to use that as a as a means to to explore. Oh, definitely, because um, even from my experiences, getting a master's degree in Micronesian studies really it it's what kind of made me who I am in many ways because. I just said, you know what, I'm going to go with my grandmother and I'm going to just talk to a bunch of old people for my thesis. Yeah, and yeah, so, it's a great way. <laughs> it's a great way to go. I'm very excited about continuing it in a PhD program. Oh, Biba. Oh, I did. And so um, let's, uh, actually, we have a bunch of questions. We have a bunch of questions and comments. You have a lot of support that's coming in from people that are watching on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. People, I ask people to put their family names, and so people are putting their family names as well in the comments. And so uh, this isn't a question. So Hafadeh Guamti, Sidus Masi, Guamti is asking or is mentioning that they feel that there is a not, not enough organization of Chamorros in the States. Every city or area should have a Chamorro Association, a Chamber of Commerce, a Rotary, or something to build relationships uh, and network beyond just the language. And so, um, especially for those of you, so so Tristan Sagaigal Guini Gitza Guahan, but for those of you in the States, do you find that there is a Chamorro community sort of in your area? Have you sort of uh, gone to Guam clubs or Chamorro clubs um, or even Nobena? I know there's Nobena associations, uh, uh, Saint Fiesta associations too. And so, um, has that been something that you have been connected to or has not? And, uh, Janae, go ahead uh, for you first. Uh, so I lived in Southern California. That's where I'm originally from, Vegas by extension, because those two are not that far apart, and Western Washington. I know that there are 
many groups in those areas. I now currently live in Idaho on uh, the Kootenai tribe lands. Um, you know, got to acknowledge that stuff. Um, but I would say, even though there's no organizations, if you recognize a name or you're wearing your Chamorro gear, your Guam seal, or even my bamboo bracelets that I wear, I will run into Chamorros at the airport, at restaurants, and, you know, the stickers on the car. And um, I do agree that I wish there was an easier way to find the Chamorros that are in your area. And uh, I think it also comes down to putting yourself out there to maybe start the group too, if you are finding other Chamorros in your area. Um, not always easy, not always the time, but um, I, I do agree, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to find all of us, but we're, we're scattered. We're out there somewhere. <laughs> well, Biba, if, if anyone that is watching knows a Chamorro who lives in Idaho, put for but reach out, reach out. We, the, the, the red rice connection, Hungan. Uh, North Idaho and Spokane. So, cause the state's very divided. So, but yeah, okay. come say hi if you see me. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I mean, Chamorros are everywhere, but I love what you mentioned about how, uh, you know, that because Chamorros are, can be very visible about who they are, tattoos, uh, car stickers, uh, shirts, hungan, and jewelry, sort of body adornment, it makes it easier for us to find each other. Cause, because I don't know if any of you have ever had that experience where like I'm like in the middle of like O'Hare Airport or JFK, and I swear that somebody across the room is a Chamorro. And I'm just waiting for a sign. Sometimes you move closer so you can hear what they say. Like if they go, if they go like man, uh, or if they say something like, you know, talky, do do doggin. Like they say, oh man, my doggin hurts, my butt hurts. Oh, <gasps> this person's gotta be Chamorro. I now have the right to bother them. I now have the right to ask them about their family and ask them what's their favorite type of Kelleguin. <laughs> but Hungen, so thank you for thank you for sharing. But yes, if you are watching, put for but put your family clan names into the chat. We've got people doing that. Put questions that you have, but also share some of your own experiences. We have a bunch of Fanatsu patrons who are sharing their experiences. And so it's 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 great. I'm I'm loving the chat. I'm loving what's going on in the comments. But so Davina, to you now, uh, Chamorro community or club sort of in your area, not or Hungen, not so much. Or yeah, well, um, uh, one thing that's great about um, I I live in Portland, Oregon right now. Um, one thing that's great about Portland is we have a bunch of uh, things called food carts. Um, a bunch of them. There's so many food carts, and I found a Chamorro food cart. So <laughs> the easiest way uh, for me, how I've here in Portland, how I've been finding, you know, my community like here in Portland is I found that food cart and I go to that food cart. They sell out within 30 minutes. It's really annoying. <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> like, I wanted my Killa Gwen. Um, and, um, uh, I think right now they have a octopus Kilguin right now. Um, if anyone's interested in coming to Portland, um, but uh, that you know, so there's usually so many Chamorro people lined up at that food cart, um, and like I said, they sell it in pretty much 30 minutes. So it's always fun going there. Um, in fact, that person uh, who runs that food cart specifically, um, um, her name's Joy. And um, she's the one who actually told me about your Zoom class uh, for learning languages because I was like, I want to be a part of my culture better. What do I do? Because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go because my family's been on the States. My grandma had passed. So I'm like, I, I don't have anyone. What, what do I do? And she's like, oh, did, um, there's this cool like Zoom thing. And I was like, tell me more <laughs> like, so and that's kind of how I got started and uh you know thanks to that food truck of you know going there a lot or food cart say and going there a lot and meeting others and and that's kind of how I've 
um, I've kind of been in the culture currently. Um, I did actually live briefly in Seattle as well. And they have, um, they actually have like a, a small Chamorro cultural center. Um, so, um, and um, the, a lot of people gather there. Um, they they didn't know how to speak Chamorro either at the time when I lived there. I lived there before moving to Portland. And I was like, and for some reason people asked me and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm like the worst person to ask. I'm so sorry. Um, and now that I've moved to Portland and learned about the food cart, I'm like, no, if only there was like, I need to go back and I need to tell all of them what I've learned. <laughs> so that's, that's my story. <laughs> One thing that I love is that the Chamorro diaspora used to be organized around military bases. So wherever there was like a, in the past, a Navy base in the earliest wave, and then eventually Army base and now Air Force bases, right? Marine Corps bases. But what I love now is that you can map the diaspora based on Chamorro food trucks and restaurants. So it's kind of like, and because wherever there's a con concentration of Chamorros now, you've got somebody who's retired and you know what? I'm going to start barbecuing chicken and making uh, red rice and Keleguin, you know, and we're going to call it a uh, Guam food or Chamorro barbecue or there's a place called red rice, you know, or stuff like that. And so it's, it's great. That's what I love because it used to be like, oh, let's see, there's a Marine Corps base here. There must be Chamorros in the area. But now it's like, ooh, there's a Chamorro restaurant here. Got to be Chamorros in the area. <laughs> Sidzus Masi. And so, uh, Jesse, for you, what have, uh, have you found that is, has your family been connected to Guam clubs, Chamorro clubs? or? Honestly, no. Um, I feel like I found a lot like on Instagram and through uh, like this, like learning on Zoom has been great, especially with the pandemic. I haven't really done a lot of like searching for in-person community, um, but I I have found like a lot of like cultural information on like YouTube and like just the internet in general, especially like uh, I think being in class has been awesome to talk to other people. Yeah. Well, Biba, Biba, I am hoping that we can, because uh, in certain areas, you'll definitely find more like uh, what Davina said, you know, Chamorros reach a certain point where eventually they go beyond sort of, uh, you know, simply just gathering and they start to really not just plant roots, but kind of have like a brick and mortar, more permanent areas. So San Diego is like the best example of that. Because in San Diego, there's now the, the House of the Chamorros in Balboa Park. Um, and there's also uh, the Sons and Daughters of Guam Club there as well. And so, but I, I agree, uh, Guam Tees, that there should be more. Uh, should be more because we have the means now. We have the interest. And so there should be more. Although, uh, Senora Lillian Cruz, Senora Lillian, who is the biggest fan of Finanzo, Sidzus Masi, Senora Lillian, she mentions, though, that what she sees is that in a lot of the, the gatherings, a lot of the gatherings in the diaspora now, uh, kids don't go with their parents or their grandparents anymore. And so when there are gatherings of Chamorros, the kids just aren't there. They've got other things to do, and the, the parents don't feel like they have to bring them like the way it used to be. Right. They said, but hopefully we can change that though. Cause you know, if for the Guam clubs out there, just like cultural organizations on Guam, you have to think about sustainability, passing on sort of leadership to the next generation. And so let's get specifically now into the learning of Chamorro. And so if and so some of you have shared a little bit already, but one of the things that I want to focus on, because I I always try to bring this out because it's such a pervasive thing for those who want to learn, is the 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 koturan kasi, the teasing culture, sort of the uh, making people feel bad because they don't have a good accent, you know, sort of trying to basically make, you know. Some sometimes when people want to learn Chamorro, it seems like their family become like really 
really mean and cruel <laughs> sort of people. Like they're loving and they're nurturing in so many other ways. But then suddenly when you want to turn turn to more, they're like, you know, they're like villains in a Quentin Tarantino movie or something like that. And so what has your experience been like? Have you found that and for me, I think that we should bring it out and talk about it because I think we have to get past that. There's a difference between sign that kind of just laughing when somebody makes a mistake and then just but helping them, right? Because I certainly remember being teased. Uh, and I remember others who would laugh when I made a mistake, but still help me though, right? And so I'm all for talking about those experiences so we can move past them, get it out there. And then... um get people focusing on helping. So, but what has your experience been? Has your family been supportive? Have they been not supportive? Um, and so, uh, Janae, if you wanna go first. Um, uh, in, my, in my family, um, the only uh, elder that speaks is my mom. She also is currently back there where that's where she learned. Um, and I'd say my family is definitely supportive. I think they also do want to learn, but there's a time and accessibility issue that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, and I get that because I, I think I attend half the classes currently just because schedules and, and whatnot. Um, but when I do attend, um, I try to share what I learn with my family and they're, they're very supportive. Um, and I think, you know, that once somebody within a family group starts saying, okay, I'm learning, I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable about my mistakes or how I'm not perfect about it. Cause like I can pronounce it all day long. I can't understand it. <laughs> um, I can't get the grammar, but I can pronounce it. Um, and that's mainly just cause I grew up around it, hearing it. Um, but I think I would love to see more of my family speaking it because I think they all do want to learn. Um, and my son, who is, uh, you know, Caucasian and Chamorro plus Dominican, he's at, expressed that he wants to learn now. So hopefully the summer will work on learning it. He's currently learning French for school. So, but um, I, I think I think the more you can involve it as a family unit, whether that's, you know, mom, dad, sisters, siblings, the easier it is to practice it. Um, even if it's just a few words here and there or a few key phrases. Um, and uh, I think just, just giving it a shot, really. Um, yeah, so my family's been supportive and hopefully there'll be more of us in the class. Biba, Biba. And Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Tish Messman, one of the us uh, who attends uh, the practice group in the class, she's she's tuned in and she says she has a a, a cousin who lives in Idaho too. <laughs> so she was commenting and saying, "Hey, she knows another Chamor who lives in Idaho." But thank you for sharing that. That's so heartwarming, though, because and and there are those who think that Chamorros all need to sound a certain way, like they need to sound like like Taiwano, like you know, like a but if your if your son speaks Chamorro with a uh, with with a Dominican accent with a little bit of French flair, bonito, that's cool. I like the sound of that. I mean, my my kids have my kids have interesting Valley Girl accents in Chamorro, and and sometimes I'm like, this is not the way it's supposed to be. But other times I'm like, this is pretty cool. The language is alive. That's all that matters. <laughs> but Hungan, get away from sort of that the stigma, that authenticity stuff, and just focus on keeping it alive. Sidzus Masin. Davina, what has your experience been? Yeah, so um, I've only told my dad. <laughs> I'm learning tomorrow. Uh, my dad is the one who is full tomorrow um, on my side of the family. Um, and I've only told him and I kind of it, it's it's very interesting because it was kind of this like, that's great. But also, why? You, you know, he's like, oh, it's so great that you're, you know, you're learning more. I never thought I would ask my daughter like tomorrow where it's because like, you know, I it, he'll start asking me questions like, how do you say this? And I'm like, 
dictionary. <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, you know, looking through it, and he'll ask me, you know, those kind of like, you know, so they used to call me this on the island when I was on the island because uh, he wasn't allowed to speak the language either. Um, he's like in his uh, 60s, I think, uh, and he wasn't allowed to speak it either um, when he was growing up. And I would look it up. I'm like, Dad, that's a that's a that's a bad word. <laughs> I don't think I want to tell you what it means. <laughs> and he was like, Ah, oh, no, that makes a lot of sense. I was like, Oh, okay, uh, okay. Um, but then it would be like that mixed reaction of kind of. So we'd have fun like that, but then all of a sudden it'll like turn, like the the typical that turn of like, um, you know questioning of kind of like well you know like technically there's like no tomorrow anymore since they you know since we were colonized we had all these other things happen so you know there's technically no real tomorrow anymore i'm like i i mean i can go really deep into that but i'm just not gonna say because <laughs> you know he's my dad um but so I hope he's not watching. <laughs> um, but I, you know, and he he actually offered. He he was like, hey, maybe you should talk to your um, my cousin Nicole. She's actually been to the island a few times. She's actually met um, my our family members because uh, we're. I know our last names are Baza and Cruz. I know that's not really the you know Cruz is so like. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> The guy in the cruise from getting, but yes. So so my, and to talk to my cousin because she she's actually been to the island. She actually knows the you know the people over there. And then I don't know why I just suddenly all that fear of being rejected by my family just like full on floodgates. I was like I don't want to talk to her. <laughs> But I know, I know she, she's like, she's super nice. She's like one of my favorite cousins. She's super nice uh, and she's very supportive. But then all of a sudden, like, I just don't want to be, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to say something wrong. Cause like, I'm like, does she even know, does she speak the language? Cause like, I'm like, cause uh, you know, it's not something we talk about in our, in my family since it was, it was kind of banned um, by our grandma. So that's why I'm like, I, I don't, suddenly the, I just became very shut in and uncomfortable. So I'm, uh, you know, that's my personal, like working through it. I'm like, I'm going to do it. One day I'll talk to her. Cause I, one day I want to try to go to that immersion program that you kind of were talking about, AKA next year. I'm going to do it. Even though I'm terrified. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Yeah. No, Bebo. No, this is, thank you so much for sharing that because I think, um, yeah, I think uh, for so many tomorrows, our heritage is something that makes us feel like held back because we don't know enough about it or because it hasn't been given to us, right? So when you have to get it, you feel like it's not real, right? And and I sympathize. I, I sympathize with everything because I didn't grow up speaking tomorrow either. I didn't know much about, even though I grew up on Guam, I didn't know much about any of this stuff. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that, though. And I think uh, a lot of uh, people who who are watching, who are also in the diaspora, feel that too, that they don't want to be judged by their family in Guam because, you know, they've come from across the ocean. But and uh, and 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 those out there have Costco and the people on the island don't have Costco. But in Guam, you have Carabao, but you don't have Costco. We have cost you less and we have pay less, which actually you have to pay quite a bit sometimes to go to pay less. But anyways, Sidus Masi Devine Tristan, uh, what about you? Sort of have you gotten support from your family and your learning tomorrow? Have you been have you been sort of just teased about it? Have you had that experience where at a party because you say you're learning tomorrow, they call you up in front of everyone and they say, Hey, speak tomorrow. Speak tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my family, I would say, has been a bit, it's been supportive, but um, it's sort of like, oh, that's good. And then silence. Um, not really like uh, negative, but like 
Oh, so what? Kind of like, uh, I got over before my grandfather passed away. Uh, I was talking to him, asking him for help. And I'd ask him a question about like, how do you use a word? How do you say a sentence? And he would just be like, okay. Uh, and then uh, the conversation wouldn't really go anywhere. It would be, it's like, they would help me if they could, but they can't. Like, they think it's a good idea. They, they're all for it, but they also don't really see it as like, oh, that's a good boy. It's good for you. Like, it's not really important, but it's a good thing that I'm doing it. And they don't, they're not really all that good at it themselves. So they don't really have much to offer in terms of help. Um, that's the general, like, vibe I get. Um, like, my dad, he would help me more if he could, but he too, like, he, he can listen to someone speaking tomorrow and kind of understand what they're getting at. But then I ask him, like, hey, um, so why'd you put um in that word? And he would just look at me like, huh, how do I, you, you, you just do. Um, like, he knows that it does something to the word and he knows what happens when he hears it, but he can't, like, explain why you use um or what um even is or i don't think you've ever even like thought of um as a thing unto itself um so it's been kind of like they're supportive but they can't really help me no see just masi tristan i think it's important to remember that uh people teach can teach languages in different ways right so if you speak a language it doesn't necessarily mean that you could get up in front of a class and break it down in lessons for people, but people who can speak a language can be your everyday conversation teachers, right? They can, they can help you practice, you know, and they can, um, the way that I used to do it, uh, you know, what made my grandmother such a wonderful help for me learning is that when I would say something to her, she would she would uh sometimes giggle because I was go flatsy, I was totally wrong. But uh she would say, uh, you know, ti tagueno nai like I don't say it like that. Uh Cosino and Song and Taiguini, can you try saying it like this? Because that's the way that she would say it. And so it was focused not on like you're wrong, you're bad, or or you know, and but it was more just like, you know, this is the way that I say it why don't you try saying it the way that I say it what the way that you're saying it is not necessarily wrong but um try it like this and so I think that that's an important thing to learn uh but it's hard for and um you know this is something that is always sort of the the trauma that's in the Chamorro room is that the language is something that so many Chamorros have traumatic experiences around right um, whether sort of being told, even in the States, that because of their accent or because they speak this language, because they come from this place, they're less. Because even in Guam, if they were punished in schools for using Chamorro, right? And so that is something that even inhibits our elders further from being able to kind of guide and help because they, they think, well, I, I didn't study this. What do I know? Right, I, I never went to school for this, so how can I help you? So, thank you, Sidus Masi Tristan, for that. And Jesse, to you. Yeah, oh. kind of along the lines of what you were just saying. Like my nana, she's eighty-five. She hasn't um, been to Guam in a number of years. She hasn't been speaking Chamoru um, for a while, so it's not like there's anyone in my family who does speak Chamoru um, besides her. Uh, I feel like when I tell everyone that that's what I'm doing, I've only been doing it for like two semesters, but when I tell them, I feel like it's the same where they're like supportive, but confused. Like they don't understand like why this is something that I want to do or why it's important or um, if there's like an actual like practical application um, because like I've taken like French in school and Spanish in school. Um, so it, it's like taking two more. It's like, why, why would you do that? Like you're not even around anybody who speaks a language. Like what's the point? Um, but like overall they're supportive of it. Um, I think that like my baby cousins are like interested, especially because, um, in your classes, you always say that like, use a language as much as you can. So even like 
I don't say thank you. Like I just say seduce masse. Um, and so like my, my cousins are like hearing that. Um, and now they're like, oh, like, what is it? Like, can you tell me more about it? Um, and that's been great, I think, as like a bridge to getting people involved that um, like want to be. So, yeah. Hongan, thank you so much for that simple example. Just use a little bit of tomorrow, you know, and then uh, and then others around you will start to use it too. Uh, Tristan, I saw that you had you wanted to add something real quick. Yeah, like something that both Navina and Jesse said. Um, the whole like, what do you want to learn? Like, what's what's the point? What are you gonna get out of it? And uh, what Davina said when she was talking about her dad, and he was like, um, uh, well, you know, technically, it's not the real. Tr that was sometimes, that's something I get sometimes when I go to a family member and ask for help with Chamorro and be like, well, you know, boy, um, what's the point of learning Chamorro? What are you going to get out of it? We're going to be you make money or whatever. Or, um, you know, technically, uh, because there's so much Spanish in the vocabulary, it's not even real Chamorro. And, or even something like, uh, you know, like the people in Saipan or Cinema are better than us. You know, they're like, they're the true Chamorros because they never lost the language. Like all these, like, just by bringing it up, like these sort of, I don't even know if they would consider them fringe thoughts. Maybe they're the common way of thinking, but like these sort of like strange, um, like fatalistic remarks that kind of get thrown around. And it's very, like that, when that happens, this can be very uh, discouraging. I'm good. No, seduce, seduce I think, um, oh, uh, Jaina, go ahead. Uh, I just um, wanted to kind of piggyback on what Tristan, well, what everybody's been saying about the, the not loss of the language, but that like fatalistic, oh, the language is dying, which funny enough, I just saw a post on Reddit that said the language is dying. And I'm like, no, it's not. Here's the class. Go to class. Um, but what we're experiencing as uh, Chamorros, you know, Saipan, CNMI, Guam, diaspora, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not necessarily just us because we can look at other indigenous cultures, um, Hawaiians um, in particularly um, are working on reclaiming it, the indigenous tribes of Turtle Island, the, you know, North America, um, even uh, in the Caribbean, the Tainos, um, of the Caribbean, we're, we're all kind of experiencing that. And I think for those of us who are making the effort to learn is to say, hey, let's not lose our connection to our ancestors, to our land. Um, we, we know we are of these people. Let's celebrate that, let's reclaim that. Um, and I think it's, it's a hard adjustment given the mindset of assimilation most of us have grown up under um i know i know being brown in southern california i would always get well you speak english very good and it's like that's not that's not what you want to say to somebody and we're in this era where we're transitioning into that reclamation of our indigeneity and i think expressing that to um, the people who are interested or who don't know why we do it. I think talking about that reclamation is important um, because I look at our, you know, our cousins in Hawaii and the Merry Monarch Festival, the things that they've reclaimed and held on to, and it's just so beautiful. And I want that for myself. I want that for me and for us. So just wanted to add that thought. Sidus Masi, Sidus Masi. And so let me give you each a, a chance to share some final thoughts. And so we'll we'll reverse the order this time. So Jesse, you can go first and then Tristan, Davina, and then uh, Janae, you can uh, you can end. Although what you said there was a perfect ending. It was it was that was that was great. Bonito. That's my final thoughts. So don't no need to come back to me, but that's that's just how I feel about all of this. Yeah. No, it, it was it was great. I mean, because I think, um, you know, expanding the view of this, remembering that other cultures are doing the same work that we are doing, but then also just remembering that for each of each person who is trying to learn tomorrow, there are literally thousands of others who are trying to learn tomorrow. 
And so it makes it feel a little bit easier. The weight is a little bit lighter because you're not alone. So thank you so much. To, Jesse, let's give you a, your final thoughts, put for book. Kind of just echoing that. Like I've learned so much from like Hawaiian people and from other Pacific Island cultures and from like indigenous Americans or indigenous people from Turtle Island. Um, and like knowing that like you're tomorrow enough and that that's fine, just where you are and how you are and what you know, um, and that you have knowledge, whether or not you've been able to name that and whether or not you, your family has recognized that that's from like tomorrow culture or that that's been passed down, that you do have that. Um, even if you're generations later, uh, and that things do pass down, even, uh, if people have tried to stop that sort of passage in order to like protect your family. Um, but yeah, I feel like everything that you just said was awesome. And I completely agree with you that like, there's just so much like information and other people out here who are going through the same things. And we don't gain anything by telling ourselves that we're not authentic enough to be here or to be doing this. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Tristan, put for what? Yeah, I think I just want to echo what you said about like just tomorrow now tell you you're not like good enough um or tell you that like tomorrow should only be evaluated based on like what monetary value it'll give you you know do you, that's not a tomorrow way of thinking our ancestors didn't think that way um why should we view uh the value of the language based on like how much money it'll put in our pockets or how much quote unquote like success it'll give us in the modern world who's to say that tomorrow is antithetical to being modern. Who's to say that like it is necessarily backwards? That's a connotation we often get, but is that true? You know, be willing to question that thought. Um, I had a very profound thing that my professors would say uh, when I was taking two more classes at UOG. Uh, it would be um, when you know more than one language, you're smart in two ways. Uh, there was this connotation that like learning Chamorro would somehow be detrimental to your ability to learn other languages, but we've come to know that that's not true. Knowing multiple languages is actually um, conducive to having a better like brain space, helping you with your mental uh, strength. It can actually be very mentally stimulating. Um, there's no nothing wrong with knowing more than one language. It doesn't dilute your ability to know other languages. It actually helps you stimulate your mind. So don't yeah. judge tomorrow based on like all these things that you've heard, all these um, bad things that people have told you about it. It can be valuable in a way that's personal and uh, enriching to your soul. Sidus Masi. Thank you uh, so much. Sidus Masi, reminding us that your, your heritage, your culture, that it should be beyond sort of monetary value that like and that our people unfortunately have accepted that most chamorros have accepted that it's only valuable if it makes you money and sort of we need to push back against that Tristan, and, and davina you get the last word on the panel and so we oh have a, <laughs> all of you have some fans by the way in the comments and so we i didn't get to read we have like literally there are on all of the different live streams, there's more than 150 comments uh, from people that are tuning in. And some of them are like, that girl is so cool. I think we should, we could be total friends. <laughs> and so, but, but so put for uh, Davina, what are your final thoughts? Well, I, uh, I, I've lost my kind of my connection with my family. Um, and I wanted to bring that back um feeling that welcomeness that i felt like when my grandma would you know cook and have always the open doors everyone from the neighborhood didn't matter you know what race you were you were invited over um in order to eat the food in order to con converse and have you know some fun and games um and uh, i quite miss that and i realized i can be that and um there was a saying you had um, that because uh, my dad always taught me uh, be the change you wish to see um, of which uh, I think I'm gonna butcher it uh, <laughs> um, uh, 
if not uh, uh right if not us uh then who uh okay. i believe um and that really hit home for me because i was like i i want to i want to be i want to be like my grandma i want to be that open loving feeling i miss so much and even if i don't know the culture too well i feel like just wanting to be that loving open welcoming person is such a tomorrow thing <laughs> so uh, and i want to spread the love i want to spread that around you know so that's spread spread the guanaiza spread the love hungan oh my goodness hungan see that was perfect that was the perfect sort of uh final word you all shared so much um from your family from your history sort of your your struggles even but also your hopes sort of your hopes for the future. And I think that's what's very, very important because, um, you know, as indigenous people, uh, in some ways, history is against us. We feel like the world weighs down on us, always taking things from us. But in the conversation today, I hope, and I can feel that many who are watching feel inspired that we, and even in Davina, your example there, that we can help bring things back. That even if uh, you weren't taught the language, if you weren't taught the culture, you can still find your way back to it. And in the same way that your grandmother connected so many, you can too. Go bonito ano isinangan mo. And so, este ifinapu para i episode pago finatsu si Jus Masi para Hamzu ifinapu mizu. Thank you for those of you who joined as guests. Se para Hamzu ni ni umeega para umeega kung ok si Jus Masi ajos. Esta aquí y otro manal le hitado. Si dos más.